Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Stars of Franchising. Get ready for a roller coaster ride through the world of franchising as we bring you the best stories of inspiration and entrepreneurial grit and turning dreams into franchise realities. That's right, Vinny. From emerging to global brands, we'll chat with the genius minds behind the magic. All brought to you by the Tariq Fareed Franchise Institute at Babson College. I'm Ab. And I'm Vinny. Now, buckle up for some serious inspiration. I'm really, really excited for today's guests, uh, Sabin Lomack and Jim Sikas. And I think I mispronounced that, but I'll give that a shot. Or have, have you do, give an opportunity of um, Cousins Lobster and hear their story? Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, what we love to do here, we're really grateful for your time um, as entrepreneurs to share some stories. And we love to start with you know, each of your, your why and what calls you to do what you do and maybe share a little about, about your journey uh, in entrepreneurship and your venture. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is saving the, the smarter, more intelligent, <laughs> better looking cousin, just to, yeah, just to get that out there in the open. Um, oh, for three. Yeah, well, we're, 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 we're that, that's the most important part of this interview right now. Um, no, I, I, I'd say, listen, you know, we, we, we started this business as a passion project. We started this together. We had full-time jobs. We were, we were doing very well in our normal lives. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of had this itch to recreate our childhood, to kind of work together. Um, we had missed seeing each other. We, we started reminiscing about our childhood in Maine and how lobster always kind of seemed to find its way around the Thanksgiving dinner table or wherever. And we kind of said, geez, it'd be fun to kind of do something. What would we do? We didn't do this to make a lot of money. Um, in fact, we, we had our projections were just to break even. We just kind of wanted to do something creative and challenge it, challenge ourselves. And I think um, inherently that is my why and probably one of Jim's big whys is, is challenge. Um, we like to continue to challenge ourselves and each other um, daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly. Um, what, when we think we can't do something, that just pours fuel on the fire. Mm -hmm. So why we get out of bed today is, you know, we're addicted to what we do. We love what we do, and we like the challenge of continuing to grow and get better. Um, so I think that's our big why, probably at least my big why now. Um, but you know, initially we just wanted to work together and do something fun. And when you do things like that, and you don't try to cut corners, and you don't try to be—you're not cheap—and you actually devote your real, true heart and energy into creating something, you usually will create something nice that the public and people yeah. want. And then from there, it, you know. Hopefully it'll explode. Yeah, so I mean, for me, I mean, I think Saban hit it as to the, the majority of our why we started Cousins Van Lobster, but there's two other elements I'd say. First of all, side note, he mentioned that he, we missed each other, but that was him saying that. I, I didn't miss Saban too much. Um, so he wanted to do something together. Um, but but really, the, the other why outside of recreating our childhood and doing something that's, um, that is challenging, which we do every day, um, I think that's what keeps it going. I think the other big piece for us is that we wanted to create our own culture, our own fabric of a business of people that are part of it. And, you know, we both had some decent autonomy in our previous jobs. I was working as a medical device sales rep. Saban was in real estate. So we had autonomy, but you still had owners and managers yeah. and people that were dictating and telling you their way, how it was going to be. And there were some things we liked about that those things we learned and there were other things that we thought hey if we had our own company we'd do this differently we'd make this better we'd create a better you know a place to work better culture better team better crew um and i think that is in and of itself is a challenge but i think having that opportunity to do it um was also something that really fueled us so when you combine that with recreating our childhood through lobster and happiness and the challenge every day of growing this brand um, that was pretty exciting. And then it just fuel, you know, it just snowballs. Like I remember when I moved cross country, quit my job with security and a paycheck and a right. 401k and all my friends and family in Boston moved cross country for one food truck. <laughs> you know, that's not enough to support two guys. And so your back's against the wall. And so we said, Hey, who would you rather do this with than family and make a business grow? And you had to, because you know, is that, that pride, that sense yeah. of making something last. Um, and see it through. So that's another little piece. 
So, so Jean, can we maybe, if you want to uh, expand it a bit, uh, you talked about growth. Uh, how did you move from creating something, uh, coming together, create something, and how did you move into like scaling it through franchising? Can you just tell us a bit about that? Of course, and that's a great question because it also leads me to the point of saying when we start, we went from one truck to where we are now, but we got to one truck because this was also my idea. Cousins Wayne Lobster was this cousin's idea, yeah, right. and uh, it's been along for the ride ever since. Um, but no, the reality—it's weird, it's, it's weird that you're—it's weird that you're lying to them this early in the talk. <laughs> Here we go. It's, it's, it's weird. Not, like it, I don't think I would have expected this to come like at minute thirty or thirty-five right. when you just start really BS. Somewhere, now, somewhere right somewhere away, three print. minutes in. All right, all right. Somewhere, somewhere that's in print. We all know. But nonetheless, we started with one food truck in 2012. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't go to a school like Babson. We didn't have a master's and any business degree. We really didn't have much restaurant experience outside of some work Saban had done. We never owned our own business. I had no history, uh, whatever it may be. So we started and said, hey, we'll figure this out. Um, and so we focused on things like customer service. We told everyone in our window to treat the guests like it's their mother. Hmm. Pretty common sense. But it's just a basic thing. We were mama's boys. So let's treat our customer service with that approach. Let's make sure we had the best food in the world. So we always bought the best lobster from day one. We still have never changed that. So that you have the best eating experience 10 years ago, five years ago, mm -hmm. or five days from now. Um, and we focus on those two things and then kind of recreating that authenticity and experience we had growing up in Maine as kids, you know, <clears throat> at lobster shacks. So we put that on the road um, and we did crazy sales that we really never expected. Uh, we did not know what a profit and loss was. We didn't even have a register on our first night of opening. <laughs> we, had 12, we had 12 staff members on our truck when now we have three to four. Wow. Um, no one had trained. So we, we were in the trenches of learning quite literally as we go. We, we always say it is our it was our MBA. Hmm. And that night when we came back from uh, our very first night of service, we had an email and phone calls from Shark Tank. Um, we were familiar with the show but didn't know much about it. That first night? Over the night? next two or three months, you know, we, we just kind of – we actually said they asked us if we want to go on the show. We said no to them twice. Wow. Our business was in the infancy. Uh, we didn't know what we we're going to be about. We didn't want to tell nine million people, but we thought we were on to, um, you yeah. know, as viewers. So long story short, the executive producer called us and said, "Hey, you guys will be making the biggest mistake of your life if you don't come on the show." So on month three of business with one food truck in 2012, we shot the show, did a deal with Barbara. Um, and, you know, really, that was the beginning of where we're at now. We scaled from one truck to four corporate trucks in the matter of the next year and a half. Then Barbara said to us, hey, why don't you guys franchise? And Saban always likes to say, well, what the hell is franchising? Yeah. You know, we knew McDonald's, McDonald's, but we didn't know what franchising was. So we learned a whole new business within the business and started franchising in the very beginning of 2015 to where we have since grown from those four trucks to a little more than 60 throughout the country uh, and nine restaurants that are also the franchise model. So that's really fueled yeah. the growth of finding the right people, the right markets, um, to care and love this brand as much as we do in their local hometowns uh, and cities. Love it, you know, and I love the you know the passion around it, and, and kind of going back to your roots roots to provide something that your customers would love. That's that's great history, and we'll come back to maybe some of the Shark Tank story and, and that initial investor, but maybe save and take it to you on 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 something. You know, as as you entered that phase that Jim just talked about of the four locations, and hey, let's franchise per her her, her comment. You know, can you talk a little bit about you know some myths you've learned about franchising or myths about franchising or things you've learned that um, maybe you didn't realize that you know once you started to do it you know maybe some people don't understand uh, about franchising. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think our I'll, I'll tell you my opinion on and I read the question um, or I, when I hear you ask the question. Um, I think the the biggest myth to me was that you can't be authentic and that you as a franchisor can't create exactly what you want in the business. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when we started the business, our goal was to was to continue the family business. Was to continue the the touch, the feel, the smell, the care, the love the genuine aspect of what we'd already created corporately. And as we started to do this with our franchisees, we picked about 10 people to start. We had a, we had a couple thousand leads mm -hmm. and we only chose 10. 
The reason we did that is, A, we didn't know what we were doing, and we wanted to grow it methodically and carefully, and we really wanted to like the people. Yeah. We wanted to have beers with them. We wanted to to have personal relationships with them, mm -hmm. as opposed to just making this uh, a money-making machine. And as we were doing it, there were times in the first year or two that we really questioned that thought. Mm -hmm. And we really were challenged to go, man, maybe we were wrong. Maybe you can't do that in business. Maybe we're stupid. Maybe we should have sold more and just kept it this business relationship. Yeah. Um, maybe we should have just said, you know, the hell with it. Let's make as much money as possible because it's hard. And sometimes people aren't as authentic as, you, you know, they say they're going to be. But as, the t as we, 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 we dug our heels in and we said, no, this, we believe that we're going to do this and this is what we're going to get. And as we stayed the path, which was really challenging at times, we flushed out some of the people that shouldn't have been there. Yeah. And we created exactly what we wanted, which is a true family business. Um, so the myth, I think, to me is that you you have to keep things so business and yeah. um, there cannot be personal relationships and money's money and all that kind of stigma. And um, if that's what you want, then you certainly can get that. Yeah. But that's not just the, what we want. And I think that that difference is the biggest difference as to why we're so successful and the biggest difference as to why people care so much as franchisees mm -hmm. many of our franchisees care just as much as jim and i if not more they are passionate yeah and they don't cut corners and the reason they don't cut corners in and they're so passionate isn't because of the money it's because of the personal care that we all have yeah. together wow so, so if, if I may piggyback on that question or your response, uh, if you look back since 2012 to today, that's about 11 years, or let's call it 10 years, uh, what would you consider your biggest uh, failure and what did you learn from it? Jim, you want to take that or you want me to? I thought it was a follow-up for you, but yeah, go ahead. Um, our biggest failure? Um, I'd, I'd probably, and it has been 11 years. So it's 11 years in three days from now, uh, two awesome. days from now. So we'll, we'll be celebrating in two days. I would say our biggest failure um, has been the, the times that Jim and I get carried away deviating from what works. Yeah. Uh, I think this is probably a common mistake that hungry entrepreneurs like to do, especially ones that find success. So we found immediate success with this food truck idea, mm -hmm. immediate. It was overnight. And I think that one of the problems and one of the failures that we, we did is that we immediately thought we were going to be good at everything else. And so we said, well, oh my God, we are, we, are, we are hot. We are awesome. Look how great we're doing in this. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Let's take our time and our energy and our focus and our money and let's start doing something else. Let's go open this restaurant here or let's go spend money on this at here and let's go try and do this here um, because we can't lose. We're, we're just on fire. And the truth is we can lose. And the truth is, is all that time, energy, money and focus should have been devoted on what was working. Hmm. So I think from, from a failure aspect, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily a failure because we learn from it. Yeah. But – one of the things that I think we've been guilty of doing is taking our eye off the prize sometimes mm -hmm. and saying, and saying, um, you know, and getting addicted to the, to a new challenge yeah. when there is a current challenge in front of you that we just haven't perfected or that can't get better. Um, so that I'd say that's probably one of the failures. Um, and it, again, I don't think it's deemed a huge failure, but it's, it's time. Yeah. Time is more valuable than the money that we lost. Right. The money that we lost, we can make back, but the time we can't get back. So I think we've both been guilty of that. And, um, you know, if I could do it all over again, that's probably one Got of the it. things that would have changed. Interesting, uh, but if uh, Ab, if you don't, if you don't mind, uh, when you were uh, telling your story about how you went about choosing your franchisees, uh, yeah, you mentioned a few things that really say, "Wow, that, that was interesting." Because you said, "I would pick people who believe in what we are doing, mm. people we can really yeah. sit down with and." tell them to their face if they're doing something nice. basically people you can have beer with right yes now uh over time when you look at how the back and forth with these people even with the ideas innovation and everything how much of uh how much of like uh 
collaboration did that foster? Uh, did, in, in what way did it help you that you are actually dealing with people who are equally yeah. passionate or even more than you in what you're doing? It's essential. I mean, it's it's absolutely essential because you can trust their opinions and you can trust you can trust what they're saying and what they're finding. Hmm. And that's one of the best aspects of franchising, especially. Um, you know, it's not it's not fair to say that my model is the exact same in Los Angeles as it is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Right. It's completely different markets, completely yeah. different demographics, completely different standard of living. Everything's different in Charlotte or Columbus, Ohio or Pittsburgh or Florida or Dallas. Every one of these markets are different. So there has to be some sort of grace and mutual respect and variance when people say things. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to serve a different lobster roll. It doesn't mean we're going to serve a, have a different looking food truck. Those are some of the standards. However, when, when, the, when the local person says something to you and you trust them, or they just have a new idea, right. some of our best ideas have come from franchisees. Interesting. And, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of our more exciting thoughts and ideas have come from franchisees. Hmm. So if you don't offer that respect and if you don't offer that mutual dialogue, you're, you're, doing, you're doing yourself a disservice. That's just, saying, that's just pure ego. Yeah. Hmm. That's, like, that's like us saying, hey, I don't want my employees to bring any good ideas because I have all the ideas. Right. Of course hmm. not. My, our, our staff members, are, are, they have the good ideas. So when you, when you create that relationship with franchisees um, – and they respect the fundamentals, right? The fundamentals aren't going to change. Hmm. We aren't going to deviate. We're not going to create a, a different lobster roll. We're not going to create, we're not going to change our spec of lobster. We're not going to suddenly do these things differently. But if you create the, as long as everyone respects the fundamentals, yeah, why not? Hmm. Let, let's hear, let's hear all the ideas you have. We're, we're, we're young. Yeah. Let's look. You know, I said we're, t we're 11 years in. I think we're just starting to figure it out. Yeah. Hmm. And, and and so that that's that's ego. Yeah. You know, once you really, if you don't if you lower your ego, then you're you, you know you're so much you open yourself up to so much more education and hmm. possible opportunities. But that was one of the best decisions we made. And again, going back to your question, that I really believed probably two years in that we made a mistake with that. I go, yeah. man, we are so stupid. We're so we're. We're two kids from Maine. We thought we could achieve this. That was dumb. We should have been these tough business tyrants, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, we stayed the path, and, and in the end, we were right. Yeah, and you. now, if you were to if you were to interview our franchisees, pick any one of them, you would you would witness such love and admiration for this brand. Um, you would you would think you were talking to either Jimmy and I. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that that that's. Those are incredible insights, Sam, and, and point to what we've heard a lot about what really, really great franchisors do. They have, they have trust, and it's it's a collaboration. But I'll, I'll kick it to you, Jim, a little bit, and, and ask you, you know, what other things make a great franchisor? Um, you know, what what's allowed you guys to be successful? You talked a little bit about the passion, but what other things, from your perspective? resonate with your franchisees that that make a great franchisor as you scale and then also on the franchisee side you know in addition to that passion what makes a great franchisee you know for some advice for folks considering becoming a franchisee and what they should look for in an outstanding franchisor partner sure yeah no it's a great question i think you know for us as a franchisor i mean listen i think you know, even kind of piggybacking on what Saban was saying, like it's been an evolution. Yeah. Like we don't claim we've always said we'll have humility, right? We don't claim to know the answer to everything. That's why we're the guys always raising our hand, you know, hey, and asking a million questions, right? Just like Barbara Corcoran, she asks a million questions, you all the success she's had doesn't matter. If she doesn't know something, you ask. And that's how we were in school, it's how we are with business. So we've learned and learned and learned, and it's been a process. And I think some of the things that came out of that is saying, um, you know, for us as a franchise, we're now 10 plus years in. Yes, you need to respect your franchisees and there needs to be that mutual respect. I think that's the underlying piece, mm -hmm. kind of what Saban was mentioning, is because if you have respect, then when things get hard, if they hit a brick wall, if they need help, if we need help, if there's something that's on their mind, then you can come to each other and have a conversation like we're having now, or like Saban and I have two professionals in a room, be it personal, friends, mm -hmm. family or really close franchisees, but you do that with the right tact and that allows like progress to be had and a solution to be found in most situations. It's when they come guns a blazing, you know, and you're like, Oh my gosh, you know, and then it shows the true colors 
And things usually go the wrong way from there. So I think having mutual respect is a big one. I think as a franchisor, <clears throat> we're always looking to get better. Just because we have a food truck that did well 10 years ago, five years ago, and the concept was cool, doesn't mean that we stopped. We've mm -hmm. looked a lot into technology, how to get our food to customers faster, more efficiently, to streamline that. Um, be it my mom who doesn't know how to use technology or the you know young generations now, that's all they want to use. Right. Um, and I think that type of thing makes it a little bit more efficient of a process, especially when you have lines and it's sunny or hot out or it's raining or it's snowing. Um, we've always looked to keep our menu a little bit fresh. We don't change it, uh, you know, as it's pretty concise, but something to keep the actual menu kind of, there's always something that's kind of new every so often. Uh, it may replace something else, but it's there to keep people like interested, obviously, in the brand. Mm -hmm. I think the quality on ingredients and what you do at the core, be it food or some other, you know, industry, you always need to have the highest, best quality, in my opinion. Yeah. That that is what makes franchisees so proud of what they serve, and what makes the customers keep taking photos and spreading on Instagram this viral thing and word of mouth happening because you're not just getting another plain Jane, blah, whatever, right? right, that you'll never talk about again. Um, and I think that it's also our efforts, like we talked about challenges, like we try to stay in the spotlight. Again, not an ego thing. We try to keep our brand in the presence of national, local, uh, regional media because we've got stories to tell, we've got things to share, and I think that excites yeah. the franchisee. Um, so I think those are some pieces about franchisors. I think transparency is a huge one. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a smaller emerging brand, franchisees want to know what's going on behind the curtain. Yeah. Not like yeah. in a bad way, just being like, hey, you have a marketing fund. Where do you usually disperse this type of stuff? Right. Hey, you guys are working on contracting new lobster supply. Tell us about it. Hey, you know, what, what's coming down the pipeline for technology or, or private label branding or other types of foods? or Those type of things because it is this collaborative piece. It's yeah. not us versus them. Right. We work for them. They work for us. It's this kind of partnership. Okay. In terms of franchisee, I make it really simple. We always say coachable or teachable. We would much rather have someone come in with an open mind than, oh, I used to be a franchisee of this food brand or I'm yeah. a restaurant tour. Like they come in with a tainted mind usually. And this is how we did it at McDonald's. Just be coachable and trainable. Like we, we want to work with you. We know the ways to success. So if you listen to us and stay in the sandbox yeah. for yeah. the most part, You'll make we're going we're gonna to work together to make you successful. Um, obviously the respect thing and I think franchisees that want to get better you know I was just with one of our franchisees in Pensacola the other day a young guy and his uh, mom his mother father and the son own it and he is just so excited about it and they do things the right way yeah. which I think is really a generalization but if you do things the right way be it your service your path to growth um, respecting your staff and creating a really cool culture yeah. um, and then having that transcend down. Uh, I think that is going to allow franchisees to have success and to grow and scale and the franchise will support them. Yep. Got Jim, it. Jim, his last point too, we can't, we can't highlight enough too is, is the staff. Yeah. And so one of the biggest criteria that we look for is, and we simply just ask ourselves internally is would we want to work for this person? Right. So when we interview or see potential franchisees, I am, I've worked for, you know, a hundred people. I've had so many jobs when I was a kid, busboy, dishwasher, pizza delivery guy, waiter. So I oftentimes go, would I want to work for this guy right? And, or, or woman? And if, if the person, if the answer is yes, then that's a huge plus for us. If the answer is no, then there's probably a reason. Yeah. And if I wouldn't want to work for them, that means most a lot of people wouldn't want to work yeah. for him. That means they're not going to be successful. Because nowadays in this job market, it's incredibly challenging to hire people. Mm -hmm. Employees have a lot more leverage than they used to have and options. So uh, if, if they don't want to, if people don't want to work for you, then you don't have a business. Yeah. So one of the things Jimmy mentioned, which is, you know, creating a culture, creating a good work environment, and our more successful franchisees have a have a group of people working with them that want to be there yeah hmm.
Well, that's such a great point because you 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 can't be more spot on on the, in today's labor market. I just heard a speaker talk about you know this generation, right? They want to believe in the brand and, and younger workers, and they're your front line. And it sounds like that criteria you guys have for your franchisee, would you want to work for them, plays out well because they're able to have people work for them that love the brand too, and and make sure the sure. customer has a, a great experience. Before I um. Uh, before I kick it to Vinny, I would I'd love to ask on the scaling piece, just so our listeners can understand the model a little bit. Does your franchisee is it you know single truck, single Z franchisee, or can you buy a territory that has multiple trucks? And w- what's worked for you guys, and and where are there opportunities to scale that you're excited about for your franchisees? Yeah, I think for us it's a it's a good question. You know, Savings Point 2012, we sold to just one truck right. to ten groups. We needed to identify what profile of person we want that would make a great franchisee and like the brand, and it's a learning curve. Uh-huh. But now if you look at it, um, there are people that come on and sign one food truck territory. Some people come on and sign one restaurant territory uh, or you know, radius. Um, and then there are others that come with bigger aspirations or they have had experience with other brands mm-hmm. or they have uh, areas they want to do multi- multi-unit deals, to your point. That for us, um, again, just kind of staying with our roots, we are more inclined to look at multi-unit deals that we have sold to current franchisees. Got so it. they come in, our guy in New York, he had one truck. He grew to four, then to five, and then he just signed a six-truck multi-unit deal in the D.C., Virginia area. So we had had experience with him, yeah. right? You got in bed together. You, right. you figured it out, yeah. whatever all it says, versus – Hey, I just met you through the discovery process. I don't really know who you are, and here's ten trucks. Yeah. Um. So I think that's uh, easier for us once we know you and you've kind of proven some right. some track record. Um. But in terms of the profile of franchisees, we still see it all. We see mom and pops that are one truck could be a younger person, could be a husband and wife, could be a stay at home house uh, housewife, yeah. right? That came out and wanted to do one truck, or we have now people that are former Subway franchisees, Valvoline franchisees. Yeah. And, and that together is kind of the beauty of what Cousins Bay Lobster is because yeah. everyone comes together and settles on this thing that's so exciting, which yeah. is unique. It's different. Yeah. And there's that economic path to your point yeah. to scale. Hey, when one truck's doing really well and I see my profitability, I can put another yeah. truck on the road three or four months later and almost double my sales, yeah. my revenues, and increase earnings. And that's true for restaurants. Too. Well, I love it. I love the criteria you're using that that selection by seeing them, you know, in action as they, as they grow as entrepreneurs and what a great way to ensure success on your part, you know, that you've it's seen just them not, it's not getting ahead. Yeah. It's just not getting ahead of yourself yeah. and being like, I'm going to chase the money or I have an ego. I want to sell a 10 truck deal. You could bury yourself by doing that. Yeah. Now, could Duncan's get away with it? Of course they're massive, but as an emerging brand, when you have 40, 50, 60 units, you go sell 10 and they do some real detriment to all the other you know, franchisees around them or the brand as a whole, you might be going the other way tenfold. Right. Wow. Well, we, you know, you in your young life as uh, you know a company, you've realized some of the really, you know, big pitfalls for rapidly growing brands that don't have the support system in place and they're more focused on selling territory. You know, and and they're they're not they're sitting by the wayside for so for our potential franchisees out there, you know, this is the type of thing you look for in a great franchisor, which is measured growth and and ability to support it. All right, I'll give it up to Vinny before I ask you where I can get us uh, one of your products around here, but we'll get that at the end. <laughs> so, uh, Sabin, I'm going to throw this at you. Uh, you know, uh, many people out there that think uh, the two words, entrepreneurship franchising should not go together that if you are a franchisee you're just taking something a blueprint offered by someone and just running with it uh what would you how would you respond to that yeah i'd say that that person needs to spend a couple weeks with us and uh, they would they would uh, change their mind pretty quickly um it's um it's it's completely the opposite um the in our business specifically, but I think in general, the franchisee has so much insight and they're on the front lines. And oftentimes some franchisors don't even have corporate units. We do. But some franchisee some franchisors don't even have their own stores. Yeah, good point. So so they're just telling you what to do, but they don't even actually they're not even walking the walk as well. We do. Um, but 
again, some of the best ideas come from the franchisees. They're actually there in the trenches going, hey, you know what? I think we all share in this problem, or at least in this region we do. <laughs> what about this? And oh my goodness, that, that's fantastic. You know, um, we I'll give you an example. We, we've we always had uh, TVs on the sides of our food trucks, TVs. One TV shows a menu and one TV shows images from Maine and some of the processes that we go through to obtain our lobster and ship them and send them and all that stuff. One of our franchisees said, hey, listen, I want to put a 90-inch TV on the side of my truck. I think we had, what, 42 inches, Jim, or whatever yeah. they were. He said, I want, I want, 90, I want a 90-inch TV. I'm like, 90 inches? That's insane. He goes, and I'll pay for it, and I'll do it, and I'll make it look awesome. Like, okay, try it. So he did, and it looks like a moving billboard. Now it's mandatory on all of our new trucks. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, so it was his idea, and when you see it, you know, imagine you're walking by a $250,000 beautiful built-out food truck and you see 90-inch TV with this imagery of the lobster boats in Maine and catching the product and happy customers. It illustrates something that no marketing material can illustrate. Yeah. And it's on such Love a big it. screen hmm. that you can't help but be captivated and see it and be just blown away. That was a franchisee's idea. Wow. And so, so and that's just a, a small example, but if, if, if you think and, and by all means some franchisees can come in and do that they can come in and say I don't want to think I don't want to reinvent the wheel I just want to do it and I want to make money that's okay but in our business and I think in, in a lot of uh, a lot of emerging businesses and brands like ours we encourage that type of thought okay and and that is where true entrepreneurs shine the other aspect of this is we're in a we're in a food truck business so We've had some franchisees, I won't name the city, where let's just say they did uh, $100,000 in sales a month. That's good. But maybe that maybe it wasn't good enough for them. So they so they sold their business and we brought in a new franchisee. That new franchisee does $150,000 a month. <laughs> so it's $200,000 a month in the same market. Wow. Well, lobster is not different. The brand is not different. And the city's not different. So what's different? The entrepreneur. Wow, interesting. Wow. So maybe that guy is thinking outside of the box. Hmm. He's driving to different locations. We have some franchisees that have the most innovative ideas and some franchisees that, that don't. Yeah. So uh, you know that entrepreneurial aspect in our business, you thrive. Yeah. And we've literally seen people double, double their sales in the exact same market based on their brains, wow. not based on any fundamental difference. Wow. wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's great stuff and music to our ears because, you know, we, we hear that a lot too, right? It, you, it's, it's, it's a playbook and it gives you some guardrails, but some of the best ideas come from franchisees, uh, as you spoke about, uh, Sabin. Jim, you know, a few thoughts. I'd love you to, to talk a little bit about um, innovation, right? And, and maybe specifically you know, how you guys got through in your franchisees, the pandemic, and maybe some innovation that came as the result of that. Um, and, and and talk a little bit about, you know, how the franchise network, you know, it, is it a better way to spread out innovation and best practices like you just mentioned, uh, Sabin, you know, given the model? Can you talk a little bit about those challenges and some innovation? Yeah, that came out sure. Of I mean, you know, Pandemic specific, that's where I would sit there and again to kind of piggyback on your question of saving, like that is where the heart of the entrepreneur yeah. or the franchisee came through. Like at the time when the whole world was shutting down and businesses were shuttering uh, and worried and closing and weren't able to keep their head above water, to which obviously we have an immense amount of sympathy for because we were obviously all going through this day by day together. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking the same thing, like what's going to happen here? But when you look at it, at the forefront of every little battle line in every city is our entrepreneur yeah. who is invested, who is bleeding, sweating, breathing this thing, Cousins Maine Lobster. And if there was any chance of fear to go in their mind, of what's going to happen in their business, they were at their shop or at their truck every day working to make sure it's successful. So what did that look like? Well, we had a different strategy during COVID, and instead of going to office buildings because no one was in the office building anymore, we ended up going to vacant parking lots, dirt parking lots, oh. plazas that were closed because everything was closed. Mm -hmm. And we sat there and had a different form of marketing to let people know that we existed there. 
And what that turned into was a wild increase in sales than we ever projected because people could park their cars in the wide open. Hmm. You could stand outside at a food truck six plus feet away from people. Wow. You could use our pre-order app that I'll get to and you don't touch anything. You get your food. And more importantly, in the times of like this demoralizing time, you got to treat yourself a little bit with a lobster roll yeah. and really have this kind of nice experience when everything else was always kind of, you know, sad and blah. And would this ever, you know, pass us by? So that was one thing that I think is the power and strength of a franchisee, where a franchisee in Florida who has a restaurant went out to our local media and basically pleaded in a nice way saying, please support my business. We are small. I am here. I'm from this beach town. And the next day, she had 60 people outside her door awesome. in line. So I couldn't pay a general manager if that was a corporate store to wake up and care about it and love it like a franchisee does. So, so I think true. that's the power of the franchisee and one of the big reasons we made it through the pandemic very strongly, actually. In terms of innovation, we were just about before the pandemic to launch a pre-order app. You know, right. Starbucks, you order your thing, your food, your drink, it's ready when you get there. We obviously pressed urgency when this was happening. And very quickly on, we launched our app. So you can literally go in and choose any truck or any restaurant, pick your food, have it ready. Um, and so usually that app was there to try to beat the line, expedite the line. But since there really weren't necessary lines forming because of the pandemic, it just allowed you to have touchless yeah. uh, points. So it was cleaner, it was safer. Mm. You could order it in any type of environment, obviously. Hop out of your car, grab it out of the truck. And it allowed for this transaction to happen where people, again, still got their food. Um, and didn't have to go through the norms of maybe being inside a yeah. you know, four-wall restaurant. Right. Right. Um, we focus on technology, like Saban said, with that with that TV that launched. And again, just explaining who we are, where we are, and mm -hmm. more in front of people's eyes. Um, and in terms of like a marketing approach, because of the app and all of the hundreds of thousands of followers that we have, we were able to sit there and market by city where our trucks were going to be on top of our Facebook right. posts um, so that – we could let people know that we're not changing, we're not leaving, we're here, yeah. and we're here through this. Um, you know, and then of course there's just other things that we look at day in and day out about, you know, how do we make the experience from A to Z better for customers? How do you find us? If you're calling us, if you're looking at our, our website, if you're looking at our app, what's that experience for someone to get to our truck and then get through line, have the food and be able to come back and share that word of mouth. So I think innovation obviously is a big thing. It's kind of like I said, a franchisor earlier that's looking to get better, mm -hmm. you know, kind of synonymous with, with innovating um, and choosing those right approaches to do so. Um, and again, a lot of that is also listening to franchisees on yeah. their thoughts and feedback because we do not know everything. Right. Good stuff. Well, uh, again, like, again, just, again, just real, real life, real life living, right? as owners and franchisors of this company. I just got a text from one of our franchisees who I golfed with last week. Yeah. And he was flying to India to surprise his dad. His dad was having surgery, uh, so he wanted to go. And he just sent me a photo, and the photo was of him and his dad. His dad's laid up, you know, with his knee, and they're toasting, and they're having two whiskeys. <laughs> and he says, Dad says hi. And I write back, you know, tell him to have two extra drinks for me. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. It well, doesn't get any better than that. Right. That's well, the working so you relationship. Were texting, you were texting while we're doing this podcast? I, no, I just got the text. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What can I say? You know, I'm all, hey, I'm all hey, fantastic. He's being responsive like, to you know, his that, that, that's, that, that's a business relationship, yeah. right? No. Where, you, where, where supposedly you, you – know, this guy has how many units? One, two, three, four, four going on six units. Wow. Um, but it's, it's, it's more about that than it is about the money wow. and stuff. And, when you do that, the more money comes, yeah. and everyone wants to make money. <laughs> you know, we'd be naive to say that, but it's 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 that's the fun stuff. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's... it's kind of like you know, just so you guys know, our relationship with Barbara is actually kind of a foundational piece for this too. Because yeah, tell us a little. We bit were about so that. close to her out of the gate, and we didn't really know why, but she liked us and we liked her. And then we realized that everything business wise that we did, we provided on time, we provided with accuracy, it was clean, be it financial reports, whatever they, their team asked for, it was there. So that builds the business trust. Yeah. And then you had to start focusing on the personal thing. And then you realize that these personal are human beings and they're actually trustworthy and respectful and great people. And so now the only thing we really have is like a personal relationship because the business has Takes care of just become, yeah. you know, the, the rinse and repeat. So, when we go to her with a question, whether she says yes or no, or a want or an ask or something, uh, it's just built on the again that infrastructure of 
strength and, hmm. and rapport and yeah. trust. And that's what when Saban's referencing this was the, with the franchise he's talking about. They may come and ask for something. We may say no, but we know they know that we're going to listen. Yeah. And if they want to grow, they know most likely we're supporting it because they have done things the right way. Right. And yes, you get to play golf and send these texts. Mm-hmm. It's all kind of going the right way together at the same time. Oh, love it. Now, uh, Sabian and, and, and Jim, if you have a, a group of thousands, two thousand, uh, thousands of people before you uh, who are considering going into franchising, either as franchisees or as franchisors, uh, what advice would you give them and why? If I'm, a, if I'm a franchisee looking at a franchise or brand, I personally would want to look for something, and this is not because we're relatively new, but I would, mm. unique. I'd like to look for something that is not um, broad stream right now. Yeah. It's not everywhere. It's not available in one sh- way, shape, or form. Like It's something a little bit unique, something that's got some growth and explosion kind of behind it. I would look for a franchise or I, I reference I didn't reference this earlier that's going to be there to support me. Mm-hmm. We've heard these we've heard of massive franchise or brands that are like they come on they do the sell, they award you the territory and they kind of like okay, there you go. Yeah. Run your business. We're not like that. We keep building our current staff to be there whether it's yeah. social or legal or HR or compliance and training just morale. Hmm. We build that because we think that that's going to make you better day in and day out. Right. And we're investing money in that. So like we are hands on and we'll work as hard as the franchisees. Hmm. Um, and then I look for something that of course is has the financial capability to make my money back on, on an investment yeah. um, in, in a decent amount of time, you know, not 10 years. Um, everyone's a little bit different, but I'd look for a way to obviously make some money. Well, that's the one other thing is like, this is a business. We know that we need to make money as a franchisor. Our franchisees need to make money so everyone's happy and healthy and good. So those are the three things I look for. Got it. Okay. Saban, any advice on your end? Um, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I think we're very much passion people. So I think you need to be passionate about something. Yeah. Um, even if it is you're really getting in for money, like there needs to be some sort of passion. There needs to be a culture. Um, it, I would speak to all the other franchise. If I was a potential franchisee, I would speak to all the you know other franchisees or as many I can to to get a sense as to what the culture is like, what um, you know how how involved corporate is, how much they care, how often they visit, you right. know how, how often they help with with problems. I think that's one of the more um, pivotal pieces of just life is how do you react when when things go wrong, yeah. when there are problems, whether it's a you know, a hurricane in Florida or a pandemic or um, bad weather in the Northeast or, or whatever, or expensive lobster. How, how do people react? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that those are important, important things to ask when you're a potential franchisee and you want to be you want to get involved. Yes, yeah, something that's innovative and cool, but also something that you can relate to right. for some reason. Hmm. You know, maybe it's maybe it's buffalo wings that you just have this thing for, yeah. but you have some sort of relationship towards Um as a franchisor, um, I would say that if you're interested in getting involved, you have to be patient. You have to be willing to uh, work with people. You have to be willing to be flexible. You, you, you cert- if the idea is that it's your way or the highway, I think you're going to be quickly um, hmm. humbled. Yeah. Hmm. It, is not, it is not that. Hmm. It is not your way or the highway. Um, the, some of the fundamentals are, but um, if, you're, if you're interested in being a franchisor, you have to be the best in your space. And if you're not, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that mediocre, being mediocre in general is uh, not satisfactory and it's not sustainable long term. Hmm. So you might, be a, you might have a quick flash. You know, a lot of people have gone on Shark Tank. We're not the only ones that have gone on Shark Tank. But I think we're pretty recognizable. And people go, oh, you're from Shark Tank. Yeah. The reason is because we didn't just get that one flash and then just rely on it. Yeah. We got that one flash and then we just continued to, to pour gas on that fire. Hmm. So, so people that people can get a little bit of success, um, you can't be lazy. You cannot be lazy. And you certainly cannot be uh, cocky or arrogant. So, 
Yeah, I mean, well, one of, one of the things I'd love to just follow on that real quickly, you know, for, for entrepreneurs out there that are considering outside capital, whether that's angel investor families, someone like, you know, Barbara. And, and you touched a, a little bit of, on it, Jim, which I thought was really interesting, you know, that, you know, trust with them and delivering, you know, results and things on time. Can you just share some insights with, you know, how – you know, you go from creating this baby and this passion and your company and your culture and and growing it to, you know, having that partner and maybe what that was like yeah. and any, any advice for, you know, folks um, that are either considering it or entering a, a partnership. We've had several guests both on the private equity investor side and CEOs and founders like yourselves that talked a little bit about that. Sure. But I think that could really help some people based on what you've learned and what you continue to learn. Yeah. No, it's a great question. I mean, I think just to start, you know, when we when we left Shark Tank literally that day, they put you in a green room after when a psychologist comes in to see you. And I'm like, oh, why doesn't I need a psychologist? But if you listen to these shows, some people that, you know, sell the mortgage on their house to yeah. put all the money in their business or they've worked on this for 10 years or they're mid-age and they have no, no potential job after this, you know, whatever it may be. And then the sharks can go, this job, you guys suck. This is the worst <laughs> idea ever. Like, that could be pretty damaging. So we had a really nice experience compared to that. Some people told us, you know, Damon said he wasn't going to zip us in a bag and put us underground or whatever. But, like, <laughs> for the most part, we got two offers. We had a good experience. But you still go out of there leaving. And our, our fearless leader here, Saban Lomack, went under his sheets in his bed for probably the next two days <laughs> and wouldn't come out because he was so concerned about, oh, my God, we just gave away 15% of our company. Yeah. What did we do? We're two months into business. And, by the way, that's fair and legitimate. That is scary. Oh, did we do the right thing? Who is this lady? Mm -hmm. Is she going to help? You know, so you're you're wondering about all this. So it didn't just start like, oh, it was perfect out the yeah. gate. But what we realized is that we had a phenomenal partner. And you start learning, whether it be private equity money, another angel investor, whoever it is, it is really, really um, imperative that you choose the right person for your business again i wouldn't chase money or capital to grow i would chase chase the person and we yeah. did go in doing our research on barbara we knew she worked with food groups we knew that she was pretty much the same person that you see on tv versus a character um we our mama's boys we kind of felt there would be that kind of feel and there has been so the right. the relationships cultivated where we've been able to learn from her She's been able to bring a lot of great things to this to the business. She's provided a platform that's extended beyond Shark Tank to mm -hmm. put our brand and name out there so that we can tell millions of people what we're doing, uh, who we are, and it's led to franchise sales or it's led to that growth. And I think the importance there is noting that that's been impactful for our business. She only gave us $55,000. It's yeah. the steal of the century, as I tell her. You know, So like, <laughs> people will sit there and say, why don't you go to your – uncle or your friend or you know a lot of people have 55 grand to give you because their 55 grand wouldn't have done anything for our business yeah hmm. like it would have been money that we would have sat on maybe done another chunk at some point but it wouldn't have allowed the opportunity to grow via the shark tank platform and barbara's platform and the relationship with her that was the right thing for our business yeah as a emerging business that wants to grow fits us right but we didn't just need the money we needed something more hmm. so for someone looking at that, I would say, don't just take money for the hell of it. Take money from the person that is actually going to help you on top of that. Right. And if money is the only thing you're seeking, then obviously go through all, you know, for whatever reasons, inventory, capital, etc. Make sure that it's not going to be someone that um, comes in and changes your business yeah. because of equity you give up yeah. for that. Or any such tri triggers that can be, uh, you know, give that more, more stake, more more equity along the way right. um you know it's something that you can kind of fall in love with and shiny little objects in your in front of your yeah. face but i'd be very very careful of that and make sure that it is the right fit through yeah. you know vetting research um you know etc of those groups good advice so so uh jim uh you were you did medical sales uh, medical devices sales for a while and then uh yes sabin did you do real estate sales or I sold real estate. I sold residential real estate. Uh, okay, so basically, uh, you, the two of you were coming from a background in sales, uh, yeah. and talking about building relationship, nurturing relationship, and being there. You know, so how much of that has contributed? How much of that sort of influenced the way you created all of this? I mean, 
the, what you're the, doing the now. Sale, the, sa- the sales background. Yeah. How much? How much of influence did I? How much of? Uh, how much influence did I have in the way you do things today? I think it had a huge influence. I mean, I I I, I came from a background. I've never had a, a salary job in my life. I'm 42 years old. I worked in restaurants until I was 25, and then I got into real estate. Um, and in real estate, you know, my job, we didn't get paid anything. You get paid if you sell a house. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty scary. Um, and, you know, I did, Jim had a very similar type of, uh, I, I believe he had a nominal salary, and he, you know, but it was mostly commission based. Um, it's that scary stuff. And so you quickly learn that you need to work and that you need to work harder than other people hmm. um, or you're not going to eat. Uh, and then when you do make money, you quickly learn that you need to budget that appropriately and hmm. you can't spend it all. So, yeah. you know, if you make $100,000, that doesn't mean you're making 100000 next year. So that 100000 might be two years. So that's really 50000 a year. Hmm. So learning how to budget accordingly and adjust your lifestyle um, I think is important when you do a startup. Because a startup is very volatile and who knows how it's going to go. And we, one of our first things, you know, we exploded when we first started. But we said, I can, how many times we were wondering, is this just a fad? Yeah. Hmm. Are food trucks a fad? What happens if in six months people stop caring about this and, and they don't want to eat our lobster anymore? I mean, things like that. So we, I think that comes from a sense of, um, the opposite of security, yeah. you know, and, and so when you don't have financial security, you continue to work really, really hard and you continue to look for problems uh, to alleviate concerns. So for us, um, I think that that came from our sales background. I see. Interesting. That's great. Um, one of the things I we've been asking folks, and, and, I, and I think it comes through with what you've been saying, which has been impressive. And here at BAPS, we, we talk a lot about creating economic and social value. And, and, you know, given your passion and your mission, just love for you to comment about that and diversity, equity, inclusion, opportunities that your brand and company and the way you do business can provide people and and, 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 and either even in a, maybe on the you know, sustainability, what, what resonates with you on that and, and what you guys are trying to do in, in that area? Well, in terms of, uh, I think, economic opportunity or, or socio and, you know, uh, kind of growth, like first and foremost, uh, franchisees, we've had a lot of internal growth because um, they've come in with one unit mm-hmm. and they've grown, like you said, to three units, six units, 10 units and more because they're seeing the financial impact to their bottom line in a positive way that makes them want to do more. So to me, what that means is, hey, if you go from one truck to 10 trucks over the course of time, that means you need more commissary and prep kitchens. Yes. That means you need more staff to be there and to be on your truck. That means that you're elevating people who might have started as an hourly employee on truck number one to be a general manager, to be someone that is actually running mm-hmm. and operating a ownership of uh, multiple fleets of vehicles because they become your right-hand man or woman mm-hmm. uh, as you grow. So there's that ascension and uh, upward mobility within our job because you start with economics and then you obviously mm-hmm. grow that and then you have people, you provide opportunity, you provide more jobs. So if you think of the American dream and creating more jobs, mm-hmm. like that's a really pleasant thing for Saban and I to say, hey, one truck to where we are now, the franchisees are doing on their own what we were doing. Um, that's really powerful to see. And you see this, again, this, this you know, just crazy evolution of, of people that may have started as an hourly person kicking a lobster out the window hmm. and big dreams. And now they're sitting here running a territory. That's awesome. Um, and so they see and feel that, which I think is great. And in terms of, you know, sustainability, um, you know, actually one other note on that. Yeah. We're also growing as a business. We're buying a lot of lobster meat. It's just the fact of the matter is we started with one truck. We're at, we're at now. Right. We buy a lot of lobster meat from Maine. And what that means is that the lobstermen are the hand that feed us, right? Yeah. They are the ones that are fishing in the snow and the rain and the sun and the beautiful and the not so beautiful days. And they now drop their lobster off at the dock and you, they know where it's going. Yeah. They know that um, there's a need for it. So we've created even more places <coughs> to go with supply, yeah. which is quite literally giving back and appreciating and loving the fact of where we came from and the lobster men and women that do obviously all that That's work awesome. on, the, on the beginning of the supply chain. Mm-hmm. Um, and then last piece is just a s- sustainability. It's always been very, very important. Like we're proud to serve a sustainable product. Like 
lobster inherently the main lobster industry is sustainable you know over the course of years they've done things to give back to the resource and that species you know the years ago they went from fishermen being able to have 1200 traps to now 800 traps yeah. you think that means they catch less but really what that has done over time is allow more reproduction of species so that yeah. even in the 800 traps they're catching as much or more oh, wow. over the course of the years uh, while giving back they have biodegradable traps. So if a juvenile lobster gets caught in the trap or any lobster and it gets the, the, the line gets cut, they can escape. But they're not staying in the trap. Um, there, are, there are little holes for juvenile lobsters to get out. Um, there are measurements. you got to have be between three and a quarter and five inches. If you're bigger than five inches, you get thrown back to the ocean because you're a big breeder. If you're the three and a quarter, you're not yet where you need to be to be caught. So it gives back to that, re the, again, the, the resource. You know, so I think all those type of measures are important to know that it is sustainable. Um, yeah. And that's really important for customers, yeah. us, franchisees, and of course, you know, the industry back yeah. home. Be be uh, before, we, before we wrap up, I want to have a question I want to th throw at you because it's, it's not on the, on the, on the list. Uh, what keeps the two of you awake at night? My hairline. My back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with reference to the franchising business, I took Cousins Lobster. <laughs> my dog. Yeah, my two girls. Yeah, my two. <laughs> Same? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, 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 everything. Yeah. Um, uh, we both have two young kids, so uh, most most notably our children. And um, But, I mean, what keeps me awake, I think – just the evolution of life probably hmm. um, hmm. and the maturity that I think we're sometimes obtaining. And, um, you know, life, I think people think that once you reach a certain level, um, things just get easy, uh, whether it's a financial or business. Um, and I've found that some things get easier, certainly, um, but uh, some things get more difficult. So for me, what keeps me awake at night is probably just the adjustments that I find myself in as I mature, as I get older, hmm. as our business gets more mature, as you know, yeah. my relationship with my wife or my children or my, you know, everything is just, uh, I think we, we're thinkers, we're doers. Hmm. Uh, we, we aren't, we aren't complacent. Hmm. So that doesn't allow for us to just punch out at five o'clock and right. Ah, right. Um, hmm. You know he he's in he's in Boston and I'm in California and I'm getting text messages from him at midnight. Yeah. At well, nine, I'm on my couch at nine. He's still working. He's still texting me about stuff. We don't shut off very easily. Yeah. Wow. So I think um, you know t to answer your question, everything yeah. keeps us everything? up at night. Probably yeah. okay. everything. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, I mean, in a, if I could try to be relatively concise and speaking about the franchises we've kind of been on this hockey stick you know right up and so as you grow and as it goes you've got to do you got to do it with meaning and methodically but you ultimately need to protect your house which means you need to protect 60 different trucks and 10 restaurants and these franchisees from something going wrong because you can build it and have fun and work 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 and it's so exciting and you're growing but like that old cliche of you can do all that for x amount of years and in one second, right. it can be taken from you. Hmm. So to protect from that, be it something that is something that comes out of one of our restaurants or trucks or a social media thing or anything. There's all kinds of personalities and in, in humans in our business <coughs> to manage and make sure we're protecting the betterment and keeping the yeah. hmm. integrity and reputation of the brand high. Hmm. And that is a job every single day in all different divisions of our business to make sure we're protecting the house so that... You know, it's not, uh, you know, ever taken from us. So that's that's something that you can always worry about one way or another. That's uh, that's awesome. We could we could talk all day here. I know you guys got a lot going on. I just want to thank you guys, uh, Save and Jim, and for 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 sharing your time, but most importantly, your perspective. And and congrats and kudos to you on what you've built, and but more importantly, how you've built it and how you run your company. It's really really inspiring to us here at Babson and. Love to stay connected and, and be a resource to you and help you on your journey as you scale. Uh, but really thankful for your time and um, 
you know, glad to see that cousins can survive and families and thrive and grow <laughs> with that healthy competition, much like the franchisor franchisee relationship. So, just a big well, shout you, out. When, when, when you have a little cousin like him who just yeah. falls in line, right. Right, 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 right. Really not that hard. Hey, I, I'm the youngest uh, of three so, boys, yeah. so I, I I know how that is. And uh, but to the audience, t- make sure you check out you know Cousins Lobster. It's incredible product but more incredibly led by two two amazing guys and a, and a cool company and culture so thanks guys thank you so much thanks for joining us on this episode of stars of franchising stars of franchising was produced at babson college engineered by travis gray karen soa is our guest coordinator and music by ralph taylor if you like stars of franchising be sure to review us wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word and share these stories any way you can